It's an opportunity to speak on the 50th anniversary to the day of the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. But before I begin my remarks, I, I do have to say some thanks to special people. To Provost Houlihan, to the other members of the administration who are here, to my dear colleagues in the Philosophy and Religious Studies Department, to Dr. Sophie Berman, of course, to Dr. Alan Udoff, to Dr. Ben Wood and Dr. John Edwards, and very special thanks to Dr. Gerald Galgan and his wonderful wife, Dr. Wendy Galgan, who assisted me in so many ways, encouraged me in this matter, that their extraordinary generosity and help made it possible to bring to some kind of closure an interest in the assassination of President Kennedy that has sort of stalked me for almost 50 years. And so to my dear friends, I thank you so much. To my family member here, Dr. Ian Maloney, my beloved nephew and colleague, thank you so much for everything you've meant to me and done for me. Uh, to all my students who've enriched my life in so many ways at St. Francis College, I say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I must recognize in a special way my dear friend Mrs. Mary Macchiarola and her beloved son Michael. This lecture is respectfully dedicated to the blessed memory of my mentor, my teacher, and my dear friend, Dr. Frank Macchiarola, uh, the man who brought me to St. Francis College and the man who inspired me every single day that I was here, uh, simply the greatest Franciscan I've ever been privileged to know in my life. So to the memory of Dr. Frank Macchiarola, the Kennedy assassination, a philosophical perspective. The um, first slide that we'll see in this PowerPoint uh, is the famous slide of JFK and Jacqueline Kennedy arriving at Love Field on the morning of the 22nd of November 1963. Uh, the radiant smiles of JFK and his wife were matched by the beautiful clearing after a rather rainy morning. Um, the president's trip to Dallas in 1963 was almost completely political. The purpose was to mend fences that were torn down in the Texas Democratic Party. JFK narrowly carried Texas in the 1960 campaign, and Richard Nixon was very popular in Texas. It's important to note that Richard Nixon was actually in Dallas from the 20th of November to the 22nd of November. Most people don't know that, but he did. He left from Love Field approximately an hour and a half before the Kennedys. Why was he there? He attended the convention of the American Bottlers of Carbonated Beverages as a lawyer for the Pepsi-Cola Company and as a close friend of the actress Joan Crawford. He left Love Field on American Flights 82 bound for Idlewild uh, Airport, now it's JFK International, in New York. JFK was, of course, the only Roman Catholic ever elected to the office of President of the United States. In 1960, he had to go to uh, Texas to attend a meeting in Houston to explain to a large assembly, approximately 1,000 Protestant ministers, the nature of his Catholicism and its political responsibilities and implications. He argued, and I think quite convincingly, that his Catholicism would not prevent him from serving his country in the office of president. In mid-1963, the Texas state of politics, the state of democratic politics in Texas, was in almost complete disarray. Uh, toward the end of 1962, a former school teacher and disc jockey, John Tower, a Republican, was elected to fill the Senate seat formerly held by LBJ. Tower was the first Republican to win a Senate seat in Texas since the Civil War. Basically, the Texas Democratic Party was split between conservatives led by LBJ and Governor John Conley and a small but highly active group of liberals 
led by Senator Ralph Yarborough. At issue were such highly charged matters as JFK's policy toward Cuba, civil rights and integration. Remember that uh, President Kennedy, uh, with his brother, had forcefully integrated the University of Mississippi in 1962 with James Meredith, and they were engaged in a very protracted and bloody war with Governor George Wallace from Alabama at that time, who had taken over in January of 1963. Also, the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which JFK was pursuing with the Soviet Union, was highly controversial, and perhaps above all, the strong rumors he was sending out that he was about to rescind the 27% oil depletion allowance for rich Texas oil entrepreneurs. So the climate in Texas was not good, and the purpose of the president's trip to Dallas was almost purely political. Here we see a shot of the limousine in the motorcade, and it's most interesting in many respects. The President and Mrs. Kennedy, along with Governor Conley and his wife Nellie, rode in the, in the limousine designated SS Car 100X. It was a dark blue 1961 Lincoln Continental convertible equipped with two interchangeable hoods, one metal and the other a clear plastic bubble. I should mention that neither one of them was capable of resisting high-powered rifle shots. They were completely unlike the, the current um, limousine that the President uses, which is uh, affectionately dubbed by the Secret Service the Beast. And uh, uh, the President is no longer allowed to ride in an open car in public by protocols of the Secret Service. And in any event, the Beast is Im uh, impervious to anything uh, imaginable that one could fire at it. This car survives to this day in the collection of historical cars of the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Two problems uh, with the car are related to the assassination. At Parkland Hospital in the emergency room parking lot, shortly after the president was brought into Parkland Hospital, inexplicably, Federal agents and Dallas police officers cleaned and washed the car thoroughly. And this did serious and some would say irreparable damage to the primary evidence in the assassination. Within 72 hours of the assassination, a decision was made to have the limousine shipped first to Detroit and then to Cincinnati to different plants run by the manufacturer, Hess and Eisenhardt, where the entire body of the car and its interior were completely refurbished. The whole process was begun on the 2nd of December 1963 and was completed on the 1st of May 1964. Curiously, the limousine was then returned to presidential service and served in, capacity with the, in that capacity with the Secret Service until it was permanently retired in 1977. Here we have the site of the assassination, Dealey Plaza, and the Texas School Book Depository. The site, Dealey Plaza and the Texas School Book Depository uh, building uh, are largely unchanged since 1963. The major buildings on the right, all the way around to the uh, Texas School Book Depository are all standing. In the middle, there's a gap. You don't quite see it, uh, which is called the Dal Tex Building. That was an office complex where the, the famous uh, gentleman who filmed the assassination, Abraham Zapruder, had his office. It was from that building that Zapruder came down to stand in Dealey Plaza, just slightly up right there, just above there, to film the presidential motorcade. <coughs> Dealey Plaza is uh, named in honor of George Bannerman Dealey, a pioneer Dallas civic leader and founder of the Dallas Morning News. It is 3.7 acres in size, and it is in the heart of Dallas. Indeed, it is almost at the very center of the, uh, the older parts of Dallas. It, it's like the original 
site of Dallas as a municipal uh, entity. Uh, it contained the first bank in Dallas, the first courthouse, the first post office, the first Masonic Lodge, and the first hotel. The four largest buildings, which are located along Houston and then turning onto Elm Street, are the criminal court building on the side, the um, county jail right next to it, and the hall of records in the same building, the Daltex building in that sort of gap in the middle, and then the Texas School Book Depository. All four buildings are almost exactly the same today as they were on November 22nd, 1963. Of course, today, the Texas School Book Depository is a national memorial and museum. It is a seven-story red brick structure. It is exactly as it was in 1963, with one notable exception. On the roof of the building in 1963 was an immense sign for the Hertz Rental Car Company. And it contained a cl uh, electrical clock that gave you the time, of course. It was determined when they made it into a museum that the weight of the structure of the Hertz sign would ultimately cause uh, uh, stress problems and uh, compromise the integrity of the building. The building had a workforce of about a dozen young men, and its function was quite unusual. It was not, strictly speaking, a public building. What it was, of course, it was owned by the city of Dallas, but it, uh, the uh, purpose was to have a central location for textbooks for use in Texas public schools. And so what the city of Dallas did was to rent space out to publishers like Scott Forsman, Prentice Hall, and they had uh, individual little offices in the Texas spo School Book Depository. And then there was this group of young workers who would fill orders for those various companies. And uh, Dal uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, beginning on the 16th of October, was employed there as, as what they said, an order filler. And that's what he was doing the day of the assassination. On November 22nd, the presidential motorcade came down to the right of that building there along Main Street, made a right turn onto Houston, and then made a 120 degree turn onto Elm. At the time, the Secret Service had a careful advisory about turns for presidential automobiles. It should be no more than 90 degrees. The turn from Houston to Elm was 120 degrees. The Secret Service had gone over the route of the presidential motorcade three times they rehearsed it, beginning on the 8th of November and ending on the 19th of November. And they published the route twice in the Dallas new newspapers, including the morning of the assassination itself. The idea of turning in this manner when people have said, well, couldn't the president have simply gone down Main Street onto the Stemmons Freeway and gone to the trademark? He was approximately four minutes from his destination when he was shot. And the problem was you could not get from Main Street to the exit for the trademark because it was blocked by large concrete barriers. So you had to go all the way to the far end of Houston Street turn left on Elm and come down. From the Zapruder film, a careful calculation of the speed of the presidential limousine is possible. The presidential limousine was going at 11.2 11, 11 miles per hour when the assassination took place. The assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was born in New Orleans, Louisiana on the 18th of October, 1939. This was two months after his father, Robert E. Lee Oswald, died of a heart attack on the 31st of August, 1939. His early years were quite difficult, and his mother, Marguerite, was forced to place him, along with his brothers, in foster homes periodically. 
He actually moved to New York City in August of 1952, settling in the Bronx. This was because his older stepbrother, John Pick, had joined the Coast Guard and was stationed at various places in the New York City area. His other brother, Robert Oswald, had joined the Marine Corps in 1952. Lee Harvey Oswald was enrolled in PS 117 in the Bronx and soon developed a very severe truancy problem. So much so that his mother was ordered by the courts to place him in a juvenile youth house from April 16th to May 7th, 1953. He seems to have attempted to have himself enrolled for a time at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, but there is no verifiable uh, documentation that he ever attended DeWitt Clinton High School. In any case, his mother abruptly took him back to New Orleans in, 19, uh, in January of 1954. The speculation is that the court the, the, the court was coming down on her with, with evidence of a neglect and so forth, and so, so to speak, she got out of town. In 1956, Lee Harvey Oswald joined the Marine Corps. He attempted to do it one year earlier at the age of 16, but was turned down by the Marines because he was too young. He did enter one year later in 1956. He left the Marines in 1957 and, oddly enough, traveled to the Soviet Union almost immediately in, uh, I said 1957, in 1959, excuse me. And he traveled, oddly enough, almost immediately to the Soviet Union in the fall of 1959. Indeed, he tried to defect formally in October of 1959, but was not successful. So it, Lee Harvey Oswald never formally defected to the Soviet Union. He, was, he had an unusual status, but he never went through the formal process of renouncing his uh, citizenship uh, as an American. So it, th that's a somewhat of an important factor that some people miss in looking at his career and his background. However, in 1960, the United States Marine Corps initiated a procedure which changed his status to a dishonorable discharge because Oswald did make statements in Moscow that he would share with the Soviet officials confidential information that he had received while working in sensitive posts in Japan as a radar operator. While in the USSR, he marries Marina Prosokova and returns with Marina, his wife, to the United States after a somewhat arduous process of six months raggling back and forth with the embassies in June of 1962. He returns to the Dallas-Fort Worth area and begins working almost immediately in a company called Louvre R. Pack, a division of the Leslie Welding Corporation as a steel metal fabricator of Venetian blinds. This was in July of 1962. He leaves this work in 19, on August 8, 1962, and on August 11, 1962, he visits the Texas Employment Commission and is directed to a prominent Texas company called Jagers, Childs, and Stovall which did some very highly specialized kind of photo design work, including classified mapping for the United States military and other agencies of the government. He is hired as a photo technician trainee at a salary of $1.35 per hour. And it was while working for this firm that Oswald forged a number of his personal documents, including a driver's license with the name O.H. Lee, and a selective service card with the name A.J. Hiddell on it. Ale he ultimately became known as Alec Hiddell. Oswald was discharged, however, from that company for poor performance and for laziness on April 6, 1963. On April 10, 1963, he is alleged to have attempted to shoot 
General Edwin A. Walker, a famous or notorious right-wing uh, agitator in Dallas. Uh, Oswald was alleged to have taken a shot at him in his home. On April 24th, leaving behind in Dallas his wife and young daughter June with Mrs. Ruth Payne of Irving, Texas, he goes to New Orleans. While at New Orleans on May 10th, he secures employment with the W.B. Riley Coughing Company, Coffee Company as an oiler and greaser of coffee grinders. His wife and his daughter join him in New Orleans, but he again loses his job for poor performance on the 17th of July, 1963. On August 9th, 1963, significantly, is he's, he's arrested for disturbing the peace at a fair play for Cuba rally. And on the 21st of August, 1963, he is interviewed by New Orleans media, both on the radio and TV, concerning his support for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. His wife and daughter return to Dallas on the 20th of uh, September, 1963, and Marina and June move in with Mrs. Ruth Payne at 2515 West 5th Street, Irving, Texas. Oswald, however, strangely, travels to Mexico on the 25th of September, 1963, visiting both the Cuban and Russian embassies and remains in Mexico City until the 2nd of October, 1963. He then returns by bus to Dallas, but decides to live apart from his family at a rooming house run by a Mrs. A.C. Johnson at 1026 Beckley, Ave Beckley Avenue using the name O.H. Lee. He then starts from there to work at the Texas School Book Depository on the 16th of October, 1963. That last picture was, of course, the famous one that Oswald, we'll talk more about that when he was arrested and sort of displayed in a very curious practice in the Dallas police headquarters. Thank you, Wendy. This is the weapon. The weapon is a Manlicker Carcano. However, I went one time years ago, I went to a, uh, one of these conventions of <laughs> and I was roundly corrected. It's not Carcano, it's, it's not Carcano, it's Carcano. So <laughs> whichever, whichever way you want to say it, I, I keep saying, I guess it's my Brooklynese, Manlicker Carcano. The rifle which L. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is alleged to have killed JFK is a 6.5 carbine of Italian manufacturer. The rifle which was found in the Texas School Book Depository shortly after the assassination was a bolt-action, clip-fed, six-shot military weapon 40.2 inches long and weighing eight pounds. Inscribed on the rifle were various markings, including Cal 6.5, made in Italy, Terni, T-E-R-N-I, that is the arsenal where Italian weapons were manufactured, and the date 1940. It was a 19, originally the Carcano, a Manlicher Carcano, was a hybrid of a German-Italian design uh, 1891 was the first run of such weapons, uh, 1938, and then this particular weapon, having the serial number 2766, was made at Turney in 1940. The rifle also bore a very inexpensive four-power scope sight of Japanese manufacture. This rifle was purchased as a surplus military rifle from Klein's Sporting Goods Store, Chicago, Illinois, which received an order for this rifle on the 13th of March, 1963, from an A. Hidel P.O. Box 2915, Dallas, Texas. Hidel, of course, was an alias that Lee Harvey Oswald used more than once. When arrested on the day of the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald also had in, a, in his possession a pistol, a Smith & Weston 38 Special. It was purchased by mail order from the Joseph Rose Company of Los Angeles, California. It is alleged to be the gun with which he murdered police officer J.D. Tippett. 
approximately at 1.15 or 1.16 on the afternoon of the assassination of President Kennedy. There is one strange fact associated, however, with the type of ammunition used by the assassin. The 6.5 caliber bullet used, n uh, n none of those caliber bullets were ever used by American military weapons in anything like significant numbers. And the ammunition that Oswald had was not of Italian manufacture. They were part of an immense batch made by the Western Cartridge Company of East Alton, Illinois, and purchased by the United States Marine Corps in, in the early 1950s. We, we can't quite document it completely, but sometime around 1951. Even though the Marines never ever used the 6.5 millimeter or the 6.5 caliber uh, round. So there are some things about that. Perhaps we can get into that in the discussions. The medical events, what I would like to call a tale of two hospitals. The real beginning of serious problems in the investigation of the murder of JFK begins with what I call a tale of two hospitals, Parkland Hospital in Dallas and Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington, D.C. That is, the problem of the trauma care of the dying president and the forensic pathology examination of his body. At Parkland, JFK and Governor Conley were shot at approximately 12.30 Central Standard Time in Dallas. Both arrive at Parkland Hospital at approximately 12.36. JFK receives trauma care fully engaged beginning at about 1243 when they get his clothing off and so forth. The first doctor to treat the president was a Dr. James Carrico, MD, followed by many others under the supervision of Dr. Kemp Clark, the man in charge. His vitals were grave. He had a barely discernible slow respiration he had a faint heartbeat, but no detectable uh, pulse or blood pressure. And the doctors in Dallas saw two visible wounds, one at the throat, which they assumed was an entry wound, and one in the occipital region of the brain, which was massive and containing uh, all sorts of brain matter extruded in the back of the president's head. Extensive trauma care, including a tracheotomy, were administered. But the president was beyond saving. And at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, Dr. Clark declared President John Fitzgerald Kennedy dead. Now, one important thing to realize about the examination in Dallas is the doctors at Parkland Hospital never turned the president's body over. They were so concerned with working on trying to save his life, they never turned his body over and therefore never saw the wound in his back. Between 1 and 1.15 p.m., Mrs. Kennedy is informed of her husband's death. At 1.20, President L uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was informed and immediately took command, so to speak. At approximately 1.30 to 2, a casket for the president was ordered from the O'Neill Funeral Home in Dallas, Texas. And being somewhat entrepreneurial, the O'Neill people sent over the most expensive casket they had in their inventory, a Britannica II casket, which cost at that time $7,500. Secret Service agents prepared to remove the body of the president from Parkland Hospital by wrapping it extensively in sheets. At that time, at approximately 2 o'clock, Dr. Earl Rose, MD, the chief medical examiner of Dallas County, had secured a justice of the peace jumped in front of the casket and demanded that the president's body not be removed. He, in effect, tried to block it, block the removal. Why was this? Because in 1963, the assassination of a president was not a federal crime. The president was assassinated in Texas, in Dallas County, and by Texas state law, 
an autopsy of a murdered individual had to be conducted within the confines of that county so that the chain of evidence could be preserved. Secret Service agents carrying submachine guns uh, quickly let Dr. Rose know that they were not going to be stopped. And they forced their way, quite literally, with the casket out of Parkland Hospital and drove back to Love Field. At 2.15, the casket was placed on board Air Force One with very great difficulty. The handles had to be broken off from the side in order to get the casket into the plane. At 2.35, Lyndon Baines Johnson takes the presidential oath administered by Judge Sarah Hughes. Johnson was somewhat confused. He did not think he could become the president until the oath. But almost all constitutional scholars say that it's automatic. When the president is dead, the vice president succeeds him ipso facto. So uh, in any event, uh, President Johnson, pre now President Johnson insists that Mrs. Kennedy be present at the swearing in, which she was, if you see those famous pictures. 247, the plane, Air Force One, takes off from Dallas and it arrives back in Washington at Andrews Air Force Base at 5.58 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The next phase is the autopsy which is conducted at Bethesda Naval Hospital. And it was performed by three military doctors who were pathologists indeed, but not forensic pathologists. They had never performed anything like an autopsy on a gunshot victim. The doctors by name were Dr. Commander James Hughes of the United States Navy, Commander J. Thornton Boswell of the Navy, and Lieutenant Colonel Pierce Fink of the United States Army. The autopsy procedure began at 7.35 in the evening, and it fully was engaged by 8.15. All three doctors received numerous and some, sometimes very uh, uh, snide directions from the president's personal physician, Dr. George G. Berkeley, as well as several other military officials who came in and, and somewhat interfered with the pathologist's work, ordering them to eliminate certain uh, procedures in the uh, autopsy and sort of rushing them through it. And uh, this is in itself was not particularly sinister because the reason was that the autopsy had to be completed in time that the president's body could be prepared for burial through the night and be placed in the East Room of the White House on Saturday morning. So all three doctors in their testimony to the Warren Commission concur that they were forced to concentrate primarily on analyzing the head wounds to the president. They discover, however, a back wound which was missed in Dallas, and the wound under the tracheotomy, which they found very perplexing. The autopsy is partial, and at best done under tremendous intense pressure to finish quickly so that the president could be prepared for the body, for the wake that would take place in the East Room. The autopsy was completed at 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. on the night of the 22nd of November. And the president's body was then brought to a mortuary in Bethesda where it was embalmed and that was finished at 4 a.m. in the morning. And his body was taken by a military escort to the White House at that time. The next uh, group of slides deal with Jack Ruby and the death of Lee Harvey Oswald. Here is the famous picture of um, a Dallas nightclub owner, uh, Jack Ruby, on the morning of the 24th of November, lunging out from a crowd of approximately 90 police, uh, 70 police officers and 90 newspaper and media uh, uh, persons in the basement of the Dallas uh, police headquarters, and he fires one shot you can see his hand extending. He, he brought the hand right up under Oswald's heart, fired a shot, uh, which tore 
uh, his aorta and his heart to pieces, and uh, in effect, he was dead as soon as he was hit. Uh, the next slide. When the next slide gives you a real close uh, indication. The gentleman on the left is James Lavelle, who is still alive in his 90s now. He was a Dallas police officer. His left arm was chained to Oswald, was uh, handcuffed, excuse me, to uh, Oswald's right hand. And uh, when, when people say, why didn't they see, um, uh, you know, uh, Ruby lurching forward with the gun? The problem was the lights were so blinding to um, most people uh, it, it, that were, you know, witnessed of the, the, the uh, TV and media lights were so blinding that uh, it, it is most likely that Oswald literally never saw who shot him completely. He, he really uh, looks completely perplexed by it. Okay, Wendy. Now, uh, we just go back one, Wendy, I'm sorry. Yes. On Sunday morning, just about two days after the assassination, uh, as he was being transported, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was shot and killed in full, full view of millions of people. Most people don't realize this was televised on national, uh, over the national uh, media. And the man that shot him was a man named Jack Ruby, who was born Jack Rubenstein in Chicago on the 3rd of March, 1911. We have three dates in different records for his birth date. One was June 23rd, one was April 25th, and one was March 13th. They didn't keep very accurate records in those early days, I'm sure. Uh, Ruby emerged suddenly from a crowd of 90 newsmen and 70 police officers and carried on this uh, activity, shot Oswald dead. Oswald was taken immediately to Parkland Hospital, and there he was pronounced dead at 1.07 p.m. Central Standard Time. From the time of his arrest on Friday at approximately 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon, Lee Harvey Oswald was interrogated for a total of a little bit more than 12 hours. Seven hours on Friday, three hours on Saturday, and two hours on Sunday morning. At no time was he abused or physically beaten in captivity. However, the manner of his detention and interrogation by the Dallas police was peculiar and at sometimes even bizarre. The Dallas police station was filled with newspaper reporters and media agents at any given time from 100 to 300 people who crowded into the rooms and the corridors and really jostled Lee Harvey Oswald on a number of occasions. Because of this tremendous pressure and din, Lee Harvey Oswald was moved a total of 16 times between various offices during his, his uh, stay at the Dallas County, uh, at the Dallas Police Headquarters. And the halls were so narrow that sometimes people were actually grabbing at him, pawing at him, one person took a punch at him, and so forth, and he was bombarded with endless questions during this whole time. He was compelled to attend a bizarre news conference of a pro for approximately 100 journalists, including Jack Ruby, who made a correction out loud during the news conference at midnight on the 22nd of November, 1963, in the basement of the Dallas police headquarters. It got so chaotic at that point that Chief Curry, the director of the Dallas police, finally had to sort of rescue Oswald from the crush of reporters. Now at this time also another problem in the assassination and one of the features that leads to a lot of the conspiracy theories, I believe, were that Chief Jesse Curry of the police department and the homicide, the chief homicide detective Captain J. Will Fritz and District Attorney Henry Wade of Dallas were all holding private numerous uh, conferences for the media and each giving, in some cases, many misleading and misinformed statements. It was this, more than almost anything else, that led to a lot of the early assassin, a lot of the conspiracy problems. The, the complete loss of the voice of authority during the time that Oswald was in custody. Okay, 
a tale of uh, two tales of one assassination. Of course, one of the problems that we have with the assassination account is that we have several narratives. We have two major ones and three minor ones, and I want to call attention to a little bit to each of those. We have, of course, the Warren Commission report of 1964, and we have the House Select Committee on Assassination Reports of 1978. What's the difficulty with all of this? My focus in these remarks is to say here that the context of conspiracy which surrounds the assassination is complicated almost hopelessly by the number of reports that we have. There are two monumental reports, the Warren Commission of 1964 and the, what I call the HSCA, the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978. The problem is that each report reaches a different conclusion concerning the assassination. The Warren Commission concludes that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman, the lone gunman responsible for the death of JFK and Officer Tippett. There were no other gunmen involved and no conspiracy. The HSCA report of 1978, on the other hand, concludes that, quote, there probably was a conspiracy involving Lee Harvey Oswald and prominent figures from the world of organized crime, end quote. <laughs> now, we mentioned earlier the context of conspiracy. So let's try to build a bridge from 1964 to 1978. Three things happen in between the Warren Commission and the HS, uh, the House Select Committee on Assassinations report. There was severe pressure to try to come to closure about this. President Johnson on the 29th of uh, November 1963 with executive order number 11130 founds the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission had its first report on the 5th of December, 1963. They had a, a, a full investigative process beginning by the 13th of December, 1963. At that time, Congress granted them full subpoena power and also the power to exempt people, to give people immunity at that time in mid-December, 1963. What was the difficulty? Well, the difficulty was that R Jack Ruby was indicted for the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald on the 27th of November, 1963. And the problem was, how was he going to get a fair trial if the committee report came out beforehand? Ruby's trial begins on the 4th of March, 1964, and he's convicted and sentenced to death on the 14th of March, 1964. Texas justice moves swiftly. Now, at that point, the Warren Commission had to go in super high gear. Why? Because the goal was to produce a report before the presidential election of 1964. LBJ was running against Barry Goldwater and he was running on the legacy of completing John Fitzgerald Kennedy's agenda. And he had to finish with that, he had to have the Warren Commission report out of the way, so he, through his agents, pressured the Warren Commission to work, work, work to get it done. And the Warren Commission does that. And I think marvelously, I think the Warren Commission report is an extraordinary document, I really do. And that document took place, was published on the 24th of September, 1964, one month late, actually. Johnson was hoping to have it in, in August of 64, but it was one month late. Now, in between the Warren Commission report and the House Select Committee on Assassination reports, there were three other less, less well-known reports that complicated matters even more. We had the Ramsey Clark panel of 1968, which covered all the forensic associations dealing with the photos, the autopsy photos of President Kennedy. We had the Rockefeller Commission report of 1975, which focused exclusively on the handling of the Zapruder film and the problems that were found with the way it was handled. 
And then we had the famous church committee report of 1975-76, the report in the wake of the Watergate crisis, to explore the activities, the, the, the duplicious activities of agencies like the CIA and the FBI. And the Kennedy assassination is explored in that report quite extensively. The HSCA report comes out in 1978, so in effect what you have are five accounts that contribute to the confusion around the assassination of the president. In some ways, we have too much evidence and we have too little authority. And the supercharged atmosphere of suspicion that existed during this time led to many of the continuing conspiratorial problems, in my opinion. Okay, we're getting close to the conclusion. The, the, what I call anomalies, enigmas, and loose ends. I want to highlight a few areas because the, the whole thing is so vast, but I do want to call attention in, 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 to these areas, I believe, where there are ongoing problems that should be looked at. The Zapruder film. Abraham Zapruder, a prominent Dallas businessman, a native of Russia, a 33rd degree Freemason, very powerful figure in Dallas, had left his office at the Daltex building with his new Bell & Howe 8 millimeter camera, and he filmed the assassination of JFK in one of the most famous documentary pieces of film in the history of the world, I guess. Abraham Zapruder sold the rights to his film on Saturday, the 23rd of November, to Life magazine for $150,000. So one of the curious problems in the uh, uh, investigation of the assassination of the president is the almost primary piece of evidence was sold to a, by a private deal the day after the assassination. That, that's a whole other problem. The film is 26.6 seconds long, and there are 480 frames, 18.2 frames per second. And this allows us to get a good idea of the speed of the car and so forth. Immediately, there were four first-generation copies made by CIA and FBI labs, and they were carefully analyzed by a CIA lab in, 19, in December of 1963. The Rockefeller Commission discovered extensive alterations and splicings of the films used. And in 1999, the United States government finally settled a massive protracted legal discussion with the Zapruder family and bought the original film for $16 million. And the original film is stored in the National Archives. The other copies are in various places. One of them is in Dallas in the Texas School Book Depository Museum. The, the next one, the casket problem. What's the casket problem? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the O'Neill Funeral Home delivered a Britannica II casket to the hospital. And the president was seen leaving the casket was seen leaving Parkland Hospital by all. It was seen being placed on board Air Force One. It was also seen being taken off Air Force One, and uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy are seen going into the hearse accompanying the casket to Bethesda Naval Hospital. However, there is a problem, at least in the evidence. Receiving the casket at Bethesda Naval Hospital was Seaman Paul K. O'Connor and Captain John Stover, the commanding officer of Bethesda. Both of them testify that President Kennedy arrived, his body arrived at Bethesda in a military shipping casket in a black body bag. David Lifton, the, the, the primary researcher on the medical evidence, has been beating that drum for years, how do you explain uh, the discrepancy of the caskets? And there doesn't seem to be an easy or clear explanation of it. In looking up to uh, uh, trying to find out where the casket is, the original O'Neill casket, 
Uh, it, sometime in the mid-1960s, as far as we can tell, the casket was filled with concrete, placed aboard an Air Force plane, and taken 1,000 miles out into the Atlantic and dropped into the ocean. In any case, it's gone. <coughs> the next one, Wendy. Uh, Oswald at Parkland. When Oswald was shot by Ruby and taken to Parkland Hospital, it was approximately 11.21 a.m. in the morning. The doctor treating him was a Dr. Charles A. Crenshaw. Now, Oswald was in effect dead on arrival. But during the procedures to prepare the body, or at least to do whatever minimal things were required, a Phyllis Bartlett, the chief telephone operator of Parkland Hospital, interrupts Dr. Crenshaw with the news that the president is on the phone hoping to speak to him. President Lyndon Baines Johnson got on the phone and demanded to speak with the emergency room doctor and insisted that any deathbed confession of Lee Harvey Oswald be recorded and that there would be, quote, according to Dr. Crenshaw, there would be a man there taking it down. Uh, what do we make of that? I'm not sure. Wendy, what about the mob connection? There were extensive mob connections both between uh, Ruby and Oswald. Uh, Oswald's uncle, Charles Dutz Moret, was an agent for the, uh, the leader of organized crime in uh, New Orleans, Carlos Marcello, a sworn enemy of uh, particularly Robert Kennedy. And Ruby had major ties to all of these figures. Uh, to understand that is to understand the status of Dallas in the organized crime world. Dallas was, like Las Vegas, an open city. Any organized crime figure in a major city could stake out a turf in Dallas. Uh, Dallas was a, 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 in, in, uh, effectively governed by two uh, groups of organized crime, from uh, Chicago, led by a man named Sam Giancana, and from uh, New Orleans by a man named Carlos Marcello. Now, at one point, um, one of Carlos Marcello's primary agents was a man named Santos Traficante, who ran um, casinos in pre-revolutionary Cuba. It's known that uh, Jack Ruby uh, brought in large donations of money to be given to the Castro um, agents, the Castro people, to free Mr. Traficante from a death sentence in a Cuban jail after he was apprehended when the revolution went down. Uh, Oswald, uh, Ruby visited uh, Cuba a number of times and had connections with all of these individuals. Wendy, the, next. the Cuban connection. Lee Harvey Oswald seems to have had fairly extensive contacts both with pro and anti-Cuban, anti-Castro forces in New Orleans through the office of a somewhat shadowy figure uh, named Guy Bannister at 544 Camp Street. Uh, Oswald uses that address on his Fair Play for Cuba committee. But Mr. Bannister was uh, a former FBI agent who worked for a um, anti-Castro group called Alpha 66 and was a very sinister figure associated with David Ferry and Clay Shaw in uh, New Orleans, uh, the New Orleans underworld activities. Okay, Wendy. Oswald is a Marine. Oswald enlisted in the Marine Corps on the 26th of October, 1956. On the 18th of January, 1957, he went for advanced training at Camp Pendleton, California. On the 18th of March, he went for specialized naval technical training in Jacksonville, Florida. And on the 1st of May, 1957, he went to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi for Marine radar training of an advanced type, quote, end quote. From that point on, he was then shipped to Atsugi Base in Japan. Atsugi was one of the most famous bases during the Cold War. It was the central base for the all CIA activity in the Far East, but it was also the base where the U-2 flights, which would begin at Adana, Turkey, would fly over the Soviet Union or China and land at Atsugi Air Force Base. And it required very sophisticated radar and technical skill to bring those planes down. I've been told by uh, researchers who've looked into it 
that that is probably the kind of skill that Oswald received when he went to Mississippi for his advanced training. And it is most likely the kind of tentative uh, offer that he was making when he got to the Soviet Union to share his technical skills. Oswald's return. Oswald returns to Dallas and New Orleans in a strange pattern in 1963. As I said, he went, he traveled to Mexico City, attempting to visit both the Russian and Cuban embassies. Uh, some of that is rather sinister. One of the problems that we do have is a picture of Dallas uh, 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 that is recorded of him going into the embassy. It's identified as Lee Harvey Oswald, but it's clearly not him. Oswald returns to Dallas on the 16th on the 2nd of October, begins to work at the Texas School Book Depository on the 16th, and of course the assassination takes place on the 22nd. Okay. The enduring mystery. The enduring mystery are all of these tentative, suggestive things that we can't easily put together. And I think this will fuel uh, endlessly speculation about the assassination. Wendy? Let me get to the conclusion of what I would call the anatomy of paradox, of why we have an, uh, the conspiracy problem um, around surrounding the Kennedy assassination and uh, what its philosophical significance is. The first thing I would like to call it is the confluence of history. The focus here is on the consolidation of historical forces. For example, in the late 19th and 20th century, they can be described as an age of comprehensive revolution from one point of view. We have the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic, if you will, revolution, and the Industrial Revolution. The consolidation of this potent force of revolution prompts the development of a number of things, especially colonialism, which in turn prompts a vast expansion of international military power toward the end of the 19th century. The 20th century, in a certain sense, fulfills this or brings it to a kind of ripeness because it's a logical development, it's, so to speak, a logical development of the fuller sense of military power. Ine inexorably, this development of vast military power leads to World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. Recall the prophetic warning of President Eisenhower when leaving office that the great danger inherent in our society is this vast military and industrial complex. Great military power sustained and developed over a long period of time inevitably provokes, it promotes the development of ideology. That is a kind of comprehensive understanding of sovereign power rooted in race, class, or economics. The dominant ideological forces of the 20th century, capitalism, communism, and fascism, uh, were in a certain sense the eclipse of politics. Something like th this, I submit, is really the historical background for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The distillation of conflict. Military, the development of military technology and ideology establish a kind of context of incessant conflict, I believe, such that both conspire to eclipse the possibility of the truly political. The conflicts of the late 20th century that Kennedy certainly knew about and that our world in the 60s was all about, with Greece, Korea, Taiwan, Cuba, and Vietnam, constitute the context of conflicts for the assassination of President Kennedy. The, the, if you will, the spear points of the two of them were the Bay of Pigs operation in 1961, and of course, the ominous Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The crystallization of crisis. Under the kind of glacial-like pressure exerted by ever-increasing military costs and the development of almost ceaseless ideological struggles, the context of conflict solidifies or crystallizes into moments of profound crisis in the social and cultural life of a country enmeshed in this condition. The moments of crisis surrounding the assassination of JFK, we must imagine, were military competitions, foreign and domestic intelligence, organized crime, and the complex and intractable issues of basic civil rights for African Americans. 
the logic of conspiracy. What's the problem with conspiracy? The determination to try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, to put the broken pieces of a crisis back into some kind of recognizable rational order. Establishing a coherent order through an authoritative narrative. I believe three constant factors are there, are present in almost all conspiracy theories. The fracture of the foundation of evidence, the loss of the voice of authority, and the constant revision of the narrative. In the assassination of President JFK, the factual foundation, the destruction begins right at the hospital with the loss of the chain of evidence. From the Texas School Book Depository to Parkland to Bethesda, the chain of evidence was shattered. The voice of authority was lost in a polyphony of rumor, innuendo, and misinformation, beginning with Chief Curry, Captain Fritz, and District Attorney Wade. Within hours and in days, and in the days immediately following the assassination, the conflicting accounts of conspiracy reproduced themselves like a metastatic orgy of malignant suspicion. I would submit to you that this dynamic process of conspiracy persists even to this day, on which we mark the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Thank you very much. From St. Matthews, the cortege is to cross the Potomac to the Cemetery of Heroes, Arlington. As the casket is returned to the caisson, there comes a family vignette that must take its place with those memories we hold warm and dear. A gentle reminder from his mother, and John John celebrates his third birthday with a soldier's farewell to his father. <laughs>